So, welcome back to the second lecture um, on sensors for ICs for sensors. Sorry. Um, so, um, so the way I want to do uh, like the first five minutes is to basically um, kind of quickly review what we did in the previous class, and then talk about some of the logistics that uh, I think I missed in talking about in the previous class. Okay, and then we'll go to the next topic. So, I will just quickly go over this uh, thing we did last time. Uh, we started off with uh, kind of listing out uh, some of the you know uh, different kinds of sensors which are small in size, right. And then we looked at some you know nice pictures of some of the ICs that are interfacing with uh, sensors, like uh, this microphone. Uh, sorry, um, uh, this is. Uh, yeah, this is a MEMS microphone, and then we looked at some, the block diagram of how a sensor looks like, a sensor system looks like, the combination of uh, sensors with some signal processing, A to D conversion, and transmission. And then we listed out some of the open questions that you can ask when you go about designing a sensor system. And then uh, after that, we said. Uh, what are the different parameters that we are interested in a sensor? The type of signal, the sensitivity, and uh, um, the linearity and finite, finite response time, and so on, right? And then uh, we said that most sensors have uh, a delay in responding to the input signal, and we said we'll model it with a, a settling, an exponential settling. And then we looked at some of the pictures uh, and measurement results from some papers, and uh, we could see how these things settle, right, um, for a step into it. Then we went on to quantify different kinds of uh, nonlinearities. Here I missed that uh, this particular uh, direction. So this. And then we said the sensors are also cost sensitive. Uh, although you can design a sensor that is meant to sense something, but it will sense something else also, right? And you need to have some way of uh, avoiding that problem. So the next thing is uh, modeling a sensor. I think I might have misspoke that uh, we can look at a sensor as a two port device. So if I said two port, it is a single port actually. Um, depending upon the kind of sensor, if it's a MEM sensor, you could have two ports where one of them is a control port, uh, the other is the sense port. Right? But um, as such, you know, a port is two terminals. Okay, so that's the definition. And then um, we looked at one simple example, which is fairly commonly used for many sensors. Uh, this is an, called an interdigitated capacitor. You might have seen this kind of an implementation uh, in a CMOS chip also uh, for implementing a capacitor. So, here the most common way of fabricating this is that you take a silicon wafer and oxidize it and pattern these electrodes on top of it, right. And then, depending upon what you want to sense, you deposit a different kind of material on top, right. The resistance changes. Um, or sometimes uh, it could be just the dielectric constant changes you are you are measuring the capacitance change. Right? So in essence, there is a change in impedance. Okay, and then um, we said we will just uh, model it with uh, passive or sometimes semiconductor uh, devices, uh, which are commonly used uh, available in a uh, in a spy simulator. And then use that model to simulate our circuits. Okay, is that okay? Any questions so far until the material we covered last time? So, did you guys uh, get a chance to look at the assignment? You did? Okay. So, um, just for that, I'll talk about some follow ups for this. So, you might have access to Moodle. 
right and in Moodle you will notice that uh, you can see all the things that have been uploaded. I think there is also this discussion forum uh, for putting any comments you have for or questions about the assignment or so on. I think you uh, used that right. Um, where did you find it? Is it somewhere? So, you can post some uh, like whatever questions you have here, right? And I think you can, I suppose there is a link for uh, like a blog kind of a thing. I wonder if that is set up. Anyway, if not, don't bother. So, you can as well email me or uh, you can post it in assignment uh, announcements and I will take a look. Uh, and uh, Miraj is here and uh, Miraj can you raise your hand. So, he will be uh, the TA for this class. So, you can also approach him if you have any questions. Okay. That is about Moodle and uh, yeah. So, there was an email uh, asking about audit criteria and uh, I would like I would suggest you guys uh, take this course for credit and if you still think you want to audit. Um, then I think you get an AU grade if you meet uh, uh, some criteria that is defined by the instructor. And I would say if you get, if you can get a BB or more, you will get an AU grade. Is that okay? Right. So I think there is also uh, something about DX grade. Right. That I think it's probably the failure grade, right? That you fail a class, and that will be given if you don't do well. Spare to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that is pretty much it. So, we will next move on to the second module, uh, which is noise, right? And noise plays a very important role when we are trying to design any sensor system, right? Because that really determines how uh, low of a signal you can measure with your uh, system, right? And uh, most often when they talk about noise in a circuits class, it always starts out by saying that a resistor has this noise spectral density and a diode has this and the transistor has this and from there on the analysis starts, right. So, but uh, sometimes there is this confusion, in fact I had this confusion about the white noise, Gaussian noise, uh, how are they different? Right, is flicker noise a Gaussian noise, uh, and so on. Right, so you might also probably have such similar uh, doubts in your mind about noise. So I thought I'll spend some quite some time uh, dealing with this subject. Right, and uh, it might get a little mathematical. So please don't face out on or when it goes there. So uh, try to focus and listen to this. And if you are, there are any questions, you know, please feel free to ask. Is that okay? All right. So let's get started. So I'm using this reference by Vasilescu. I hope I'm saying it right. Uh, this is um, uh, the book called Electronic Noise and Interfering Signals, and uh, that is what I'm referring to for this subject. So noise, by definition, uh, there is no one definition for it, and it basically says it's any unwanted disturbance. That's imposed on a signal that is carrying information. Okay, um, and uh, and the problem with noise is that it interferes with it, uh, the signal, and then you cannot infer the information that's contained in the signal. Right? Um, so noise is basically of two types. Um, broadly, can be classified as two types. Uh, something which is extrinsic and the other thing could be intrinsic, right? So extrinsic is uh, as noise, which is basically uh, coming from something outside the system of interest, right? If you have a circuit or if you have a, a set of amplifiers and an A2D converter, and if you have like a power line close to it and it is interfering with it, uh, that is extrinsic to the system of interest, right? And whatever noise is generated by the resistors and the diodes and the transistors inside that amplifier is intrinsic noise. Okay, 
and uh, you might very often you know measure like a sinusoidal signal on an oscilloscope right and uh, what you expect is it looks perfectly neat and nice but unfortunately that's not the case you will have like very noisy kind of a wave right it could also be that there are some clocks or some uh, signals which are um, close to these uh, uh, signal lines itself of interest and you might get such glitches once in something like this right you might have definitely seen this uh, in your measurements right and uh, these periodic nice looking glitches are essentially something external to the system that is getting coupled right it could also be that whereas uh, it is hard to say what's happening with uh, the uh, kind of non uniform or non periodic disturbances right you it's unclear if it's generated by the circuit or if it's getting interfered from somewhere else okay. all right so why do we have to worry about noise in sensor circuits i think i did mention about it right very quickly so you guys can repeat what i said or maybe add on to it. Okay, noise can dominate signals. So, what's the problem with it? Okay, so it affects your minimum signal that you can detect, right? Minimum signal. Okay, then as far as circuits are concerned, uh, any comment on that? noise could saturate the amplifier noise could saturate the amplifier yes um, but there is a catch there i think we'll come to that a little later right if your noise is so high that you are only basically we'll come to that point i'll i'll come back to that right. anything else what are the implications for circuits the noise is too high. How do you have you thought about or in your classes in uh, CMOS analog have you seen some of the ways in which noise can be reduced? It's not a star. Okay. So anyway, so I'll mention that uh, if you want, if you have a noisy circuit, there are ways you can reduce it, and that really affects the power. And area or area of your circuits. Okay, so let's say you start out by having a sensor um, uh, front end if you want to design something, and then it turns out that the noise is very high, right? And one way to reduce it is basically to burn more power. Okay, uh, and the consequence of that is that the battery life of this system comes down. Right, so these are connected problems. Okay, um, and the next thing is uh, it determines what is called the dynamic range. Of your system. Right. So, have you guys come across this word dynamic range before? Yes. Right. So, if your minimum signal that you can detect is limited by the noise, then your so is the dynamic range, right? And uh, if by reducing the noise in your system, you can improve the dynamic range. Is that okay? And uh, then there are other terms like probability of detection and probability of false alarm, which you can improve by changing the noise or reducing the noise right this particular topic we will discuss it in the next one i think the uh, in one or two class later right this is quite important if you are trying to 
Yes. 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 Conservative or not? We'll come to that point later. I think I get what you're saying. Um, but the the let's say your bandwidth of your amplifier is one kilohertz, right? Now the noise power is getting filtered at one kilohertz, right? And the signal power also gets filtered at one kilohertz, right? So now it's not that the filtering itself is improving the performance. We will come to this. Yeah. I think I'll come to this topic just in a few minutes. Basically, it's the maximum and the minimum signal ratio of the max. It's like you can define it in dB of the dynamic range is basically the input. Is it even dependent on that? Actually, dynamic range is the minimum and the maximum signal that you can handle in the circuit, right? So, um, it really does not matter how you look at it because let us say all you care about is let us say the input starts increasing in amplitude, right? And the amplifier has a certain supply and you, your output cannot go beyond that, right? Because it is, let us say, for example, just to give you a very quick, uh, let us say you have an amplifier with gain of 10. Right, and you have a one volt supply, right? And uh, now if or hundred maybe. So what is the minimum input you can handle? Maximum input you can handle. So here, if you have a sinusoidal, you can place it at zero point five volts and go up to almost up to let's say zero point five volts, right? So what is the input amplitude? So it's like 0 0.5 by 100, right? It's like 5 millivolts. This is your maximum input signal. So the minimum input signal is determined by the noise in the system, right? Because let's say you have an input referred noise which is 1 microvolt, right? So this ratio is your dynamic rate. Is that clear? Okay. So I for this particular question, it becomes clear in the future. I think there is some mismatch between what we, if you look at the SNR, right, it is the ratio of power of the signal to the noise, right. I do not think that uh, the, as far as the uh, circuit is concerned, it behaves differently when you look at noise or when you look at signal, right. Is that, okay, I will, I will come to that. If there is question at that point, please let So, any good things about noise? Correct. So, oscillators. This is one uh, helps to get. Yeah, anything else? See, this is sometimes a problem. So, if you have a circuit and you design an oscillator on the chip, right, and most often it does not get, if it does not get uh, started and if it does not oscillate, so what you do is do some tricks where you inject noise in the supply uh, or somehow in like inject a current pulse or something so that it gets started, right. You intentionally inject noise uh, so that oscillator starts, okay. Uh, anything else? I do not think it is, uh, okay. So, you are saying that if we have a jammer which is generating a big single tone high frequency signal which jams your receiver. I do not know if it is a good thing about it, but yeah. 
So the other thing is also uh, sometimes it helps with uh, you know latch and metastability, avoiding metastability, right? So you might have seen if you have a NAND gate in feedback, there is a possibility that all of it will settle to one intermediate value, right? So it helps to avoid metastability. Okay, good. So let's move on. So these terms you often see with reference to noise, right? Sometimes if you're like uh, reading papers, it's very interchangeably used, right? Deviation of the signal, interference, variations, fluctuations, bouncing of signals, spurious signals, right? So, uh, so it's so you have to kind of dive deeper into these terms to really understand what these mean. As far as the circuit is concerned, right, and uh, uh, that's where I think it's important to not kind of just consider all of it as just some kind of an additive noise that is uh, perturbing your signal. Okay, rather to kind of go down and see what they are meaning whenever they say these words. Okay, all right. So the reason why noise arises, I think, the argument for this is that the charges are discrete. Right, and uh, um, there is thermal. They have some thermal energy associated with them, and they are, that causes them to kind of have these random movements in uh, in the material. Right, and when you when you have let's say a simple resistor, and you are connecting the two ends of it and measuring the voltage across it, then there are random number of charges going out and inside this resistor. Right, and that causes an like an electric field or an voltage drop which leads to noise right so this to me is a very hand wavy uh, argument but the actual physics of the noise generation is very intricate right it's not something that you can explain it with such simple arguments right but intuitively it kind of makes sense that charges are discrete and they have some thermal energy and they are going about getting scattered all, all around the semiconductor or a resistive material but it is not a straightforward uh, uh, thing in reality ok all right so um, so now I think because these are kind of a random uh, it is a randomness in this system we want to kind of somehow uh, model this and understand this better ok so uh, let us get started with that. So, um, so we can consider model noise as follows, you know at any given node in the circuit, let us say the voltage is a random variable, alright. So, um, with some instantaneous value, ok. And now, um, so let us say this, this voltage is a random variable v of y of which is represented by x ok. Now let uh, let us call this uh, value delta p is the probability that you know x takes a value x to x plus some dx ok or delta is that fine. But some random variable let us say it has uh, it can take any kind of value right and uh, we say that delta p is the probability that it takes a value between two numbers x and x plus delta x right. Now, um, we can measure let us say we can measure this value x right um, continuously and take samples of this right and it let it let's say that let x take values right you kind of continuously measure this voltage and then you kind of measure x1, x2 and so on all the way up to this extent plus one more, right? Yeah. And uh, 
now you can plot all the values that x has taken and the number of values that it has taken right and split it up into different bins okay right is that okay not okay so you take a value you kind of measure some voltage let's say right and you keep on measuring it and you keep on noting it down right it, it kind of keeps putting different values out and now you you kind of list out all those values let's say as a vector right and now you can somehow you have to represent this in a in a way that you understand how this x is behaving right and you'll say that let me split up the uh, you know plot this x and say that x takes a value uh, 0 1 2 3 uh, 4 5 and so on. 2 minus 3 these are binning right you put bins and you say how many values each of these things takes right so in 10000 samples how many of them have taken a value between 0 and 1 okay and this uh, let's say looks something like this and uh, It could be anything, right? It could be anything, and uh, I'm just drawing it Gaussian so that in most circuits it turns out to be that. But uh, this could be anything. It could be uniformly distributed. It could be uh, Poisson, whatnot, right? And uh, now this this okay, the sum of all these values. This could be hundred. This could be ninety, and so on and so forth. The sum of all these values that it takes uh, should be one. Let's say we have ten thousand samples. So you add up all these numbers, right? What should be that? You have ten thousand samples, and you plot it in some bins okay and when you sum up all these numbers what it should be zero why right. this is not zero hundred plus ninety plus whatever seventy yeah ten thousand so basically you are splitting up your data into bins and then saying within a bin how many of them are there yeah this is the x plus the actual value right and this is the number of occurrences right now uh, let's take a simple example to illustrate this right for a discrete case okay now let's say x has this is only i think you would have done this enough number of times but just to kind of give you a review so let's say x takes on these values right um, two two Zero, two, two, three, right? And we have eight values total. Okay. Is that fine? So now let's say we split this up in a way. Uh, we say number of occurrences and occurrences are zero, one, two, three, four, one, one. Okay. Now, how many occurrences are there um, for zero? Two. Okay. So we will just say two. Just scale. Okay. How many for one? None. Right. And uh, how many for two? Oh. Scale is two. And we have uh, zero has two, one has two, two has three, three has one. Um, 
times zero two plus then what? Is that okay? Not true. Okay, that's fine, right? Now you can then say um, how many times um, you can then divide this occurrences with. Uh, this is easy for me to do, but uh, if you are trying to write the whole thing down, I can do this thing easily. Okay, so you can then divide. Uh, the number of occurrences with the total number of samples, right, to give you the probability of each value occurring. Okay. Now, how many samples do you have? Total eight samples, right? And what will be the probability now? Yeah, so this will be three by eight, two by eight, and one by two. Okay. So now uh, within that sample set, zero has the probability of occurring one fourth of the times, and two has the probability of occurring three fourth of the times, and so on, three eighth of the times, and so on. Right? Now um, you can easily get the mean value for all your samples by saying the following: probability of each. Times the actual value when you sum it up from one to n. Is that fine? Okay. So when you do this, what will it be? So let's take minus three, the first sample, and it has a probability of one eighth, right? And minus two has the probability of one eighth, right? And uh, zero has the probability of two eighth. And two has the probability of three eighths, and three has the probability of one eighth. Okay. Now, what will this value be? So each to cancel out, right? This is zero. So it's basically six by eight minus two by eight, so it's one by two, right? So can you just simply sum this up and see if that's true? It's true, right? So when you sum this up, it comes out to be also one half, right? So uh, basically, what this means is that the following, right? So um, if x, right, um, has some value, and you multiply with the probability of occurrence, and you sum it all up, you get the mean value, right? So this is basic probability. And uh, now uh, we can then say now if x takes on continuous values rather than discrete values, right? Then this probability will be a continuous function, right? And that's uh, basically sometimes called the probability density function, right? And uh, that by definition is the following. What it means is that you bin it with really small pins rather than binning it like increments of 0, 1, 2, and so on. You kind of make it as small as possible, and then you say that the number of samples that exist between two values x and x plus delta x, right, and you divide it by this interval, and then this you divide it like just the way we did here. We divide it with the total number of samples. We also do the same here, right? So that kind of gives you. Uh, there is another caveat. Yes. And then you say, so you take as many samples as possible, and you make your bin size as small as possible. And then you can get a function which is called the probability density function, which is defined as the number of samples that exist between two intervals, right? 
as you as when as you increase the number of samples and as you kind of come down in uh, the uh, spin size. Right? Now, um, consequently, you know you can get the probability that this variable x takes a value some x zero and x one. Uh, what is it? Let me pause all the time. It's integral of x one to x two. X. Okay. This is known. Now, huh? now how do you get the mean of x? This random variable. Uh, so for all values of x. And uh, now this is also sometimes called the expected value of the random variable x, right? And uh, there is also this other term uh, which is called the variance of the random variable. What is this? So it's basically the average of x minus x squared. All right. So, uh, oh, oh, sorry, x zero. Okay, that fine. All right. So this is all basic properties. Now, um, the question is: you go to the lab and you kind of measure some noisy waveform, right? That looks like this. Okay, and so on, right? Like it looks like this. Now, this is time, this is what you measure, right? How do you get the variance from this? This you record in your oscilloscope, right? You can record some time and uh, yeah, that's theory, but this is practical. How do you do this? Oh, DSLs have an inbuilt function, and you press it, it gives you the answer. Okay. And do what? It's all correct. So, what he's saying is you have a way of exporting it, the data into uh, some format and you import it in a processing tool like MATLAB. Now, what? I want, I'm interested in the variance of this lab. So one, yeah. Anyway, this is a very common thing, right? You have measured a waveform; it looks noisy, but you want to quantify it, which can be done with variance, right? How do you do this? Okay, there are okay, fine, yeah, yeah. So there, you are. Um, what if the curve doesn't look Gaussian? Okay, you have a function called variance. Okay, well that's fair. But uh, okay, fine. I mean, you guys have functions for everything, yeah. So anyway, so one way to do this is the following: is to just subtract the mean, right? What that does is. Uh, when you subtract the mean, what happens is right, it basically shifts down, correct. So, whatever the mean of this waveform was, um, this was probably the mean, right, and you shift it down and it comes on, right. Now, you square this waveform. So this is x minus the average value, right? Now, when you square this waveform, how does it look? Nothing will be negative, right? It will all look something. 
this. I'm just drawing it so quite more nice here. Something like that, right? Okay. Now you take the mean of this value, right? And so take the mean of that value, and that value is your variance. Right now, um, how do you know if this value is the right value? Uh, how do you know you have acquired enough data for getting the variance? Right. So let's say I took only this much data. Right. Sorry, is the same. So one, I think you are alluding to the fact that you can, you know, record, take a small segment of this data and then see if the variance is what this value is, right? Um, and uh, then start increasing the length of your data, right? And once it's no more changing significantly, that's the actual variance of your data, right? Because let's say you take only one or two samples, that variance might turn out to be significantly different from uh, enough number of samples, right? And you, just by doubling the amount of data that you have acquired, uh, if the variance doesn't change, then it doesn't really matter. Okay. All right. So, what is the unit here of variance if you are measuring wool? Also, now the thing is, most natural phenomena have what is called a Gaussian or normal probability density function and I am sure you know all of you might have seen this before and um, this is usually represented as follows. This you might have seen before, if not. This is how it looks. At least the functional description looks like. Right. Um, so just uh, give me one. So what I want to basically show you, uh, and by that, so what is mu mean and sigma square is the variance sigma is the center all right so I basically you know had the math the matlab function it basically has this you see I am defining like a variable for me um, which has like three mean values and three sigma values and then uh, x takes on values in steps of 0 0.01 to minus 1. This is just to show an example. So I am plotting this function here which I just wrote and uh, let's run this code. Okay, so get this right. So fairly straightforward. Okay. Now um, you'll see that if the way this particular curve here, right? Yeah, this particular curve, uh, the mean value is two and a half, is two, and uh, the sigma for that is half, right? So it's very narrow. So that the values that it takes is constrained. And on the contrary, this yellow curve here is uh, has a mean of minus two. I have just put different means so that they are not all sitting on top of each other. So the values it takes is um, very wide. Okay. Uh, now um, 
when you measure something like this on an oscilloscope, which of those waveforms do you think will be the noisiest one? The yellow one, right? So, um, that particular curve, when you measure uh, if it is very noisy, that means the variance is high, and when you plot the amplitudes that it takes, then those amplitudes will be very, uh, you know, uh, it's, it will be varying a lot. Go back to this. So, now I think another thing uh, is of interest is this uh, term called correlation. So, I think last time when we were discussing, I think who brought this up? Uh, maybe today, okay, I think we he is not here today. So, anyway, so there was this um, at least I had this confusion of accuracy and uh, what was the other word? Precision, right? So, basically, what it really means is the following let us say you are measuring some quantity, right, again and again, right. Let us say temperature of today uh, with a thermometer, right. It you keep on tracking this temperature and you plot it in, uh, and you plot the distribution, and let us say it looks to be this, right. And let us say the actual temperature, if you use like really superb equipment, which is very expensive. And uh, it tells you the exact temperature um, perfectly correctly, which is again a question mark. But let's say that that's the true value. Okay. And what you're measuring with this, uh, you know, your watch temp like some temperature could be telling you this is the actual temperature. For example. So, this measure is the accuracy, right. How off are you from um, the real value for that parameter, right? And this quantifies precision. So, if you just google these two words and uh, I am sure you know nowadays everything is all online right and uh, you will see some nice um, uh, pictures which kind of give you a different picture like let us say you have a bullseye, right and if you are aiming to the center then you are accurate right. But if you are aiming somewhere else but you are you are correctly aiming at that different point at all the time then you are very precise ok. So, this is a different analogy. So, now let us uh, take up the uh, next thing which is uh, the correlation right one example. So, that has to be with always with a different uh, more precise equipment I will give you a simple example ok. So, um, let us say you have a microscope right which is the standard you know the two eye lens kind of a microscope right? and let us say you are trying to image some very thin wire right. Now, if you somehow have a way of saying the width of that wire right. So, it is you it is going to be imprecise because uh, it even the wavelength of light we can see is about 700 up to 700 nanometer 400 to 700 right. So, you cannot really see a, a, a trace which is smaller than that in the visible spectrum right. So, if you are trying to see a 1 micron wide wire with a improper device, then you are always having some error in measuring that correct. Now, on the contrary you can say look um, I want to still get a much better value. So, you can use something like a scanning electron microscope or something, which is much more sophisticated uh, and uh, has a different way of measuring the same thing right which you can measure up to 10 20 nanometers or even up to 50 nanometers. So, the value that you measure there with that equipment versus this one um, there will be a mismatch, but a higher end equipment will give you a, a the true value better right. It is always there will be some mismatch, but it is getting close to the true value right. Even time for example right, there are cesium clocks which are so precise in telling you the actual time. So, you use that clock as a reference to calibrate your uh, other improper clocks, right. So, that is one way to do it. 
bacteria. So, but that is the only way I think is is possible. That is a good question. Why should the cesium clock be an accurate clock? Right? I think that I have no answer. Right. Maybe there are some physicists have spent many years figuring that out, but I think the understanding there should be some physics to why that is the case. I do not think you can use some other CCM clock to say that this CCM clock is good, right? So, that is ok. So, correlation I mean, very one uh, simple example I mean, all of us are living in Mumbai and once you graduate, I mean, even if you go to Bangalore or somewhere, you want to buy a house, for example. And here, this is the cost of a house and the area, ok. Right? You try out and look up on different websites, and usually, there is some good connection between the cost and the area, right? Each house might have a different. Uh, Value right individually, the area could still be a Gaussian distribution, right? You can have within some locality some mean value could be like 1000 square feet, right? And then there could be some variations around it, like something could be 1100, something could be 1500, but something being 3000 is very unlikely, right? So, each of these could be Gaussian. But there is some correlation between the two, right? So this is what I'm saying here, right? When you kind of have two variables, each of them are distributed in certain ways, and there's a correlation. Now, um, again, some maths. Okay. So let's say you have two random variables, x1 and x2. Okay. Each of them can take on different values, right? Random values. Now, um, let us say these mean of each of those are 0, alright. Now, um, when you add, let us say you add these two variables, right. Clear a little later why, okay. When you add these two variables, what happens to the mean of y? Mean of y will be 0. So, basically the idea is that expected value of x1 plus x2 will be just the sum of those two, right. And that if you do all that we just discussed just now with that integration and all that it turns out to be u1 plus y2 which is ok. Now, what is the variance of y, right. This is expected value of y minus this square, right? And this is expected value of square two y y square, right? This is nothing but expected value of I mean, all this is something you probably oh, plus. All this you might have seen already, right? And um, right. Um, I don't think it's necessary to write it down. Just see it. So, what is expected value of y squared? Zero, right? This is said the mean is zero, and now you can split y as x one plus x two. Right, and when you write it out, so you get x1 squared plus expected value of x2 squared x2 expected value of x1 is that true? No. Okay. Now sorry. Okay, so going back to this example. Right. This is the example of correlated case, right. So, now area if this is x1 and the cost is x2. So, there is some relation between the two, right. 
now you can also argue the following right so area of the house right and then you can say what price of tomatoes right obviously there could be some correlation but more often there will be nothing right so when you plot all of this then it may turn out to be all scattered in like this circular fashion right and right so these two variables are uncorrelated right at least graphically you can see this right so when you take the product of all the individual values that they take right and average it it turns out to be zero ah here i think one mistake i did was we kind of get rid of the mean right you have to subtract out the mean but you get the idea right let's say you take area of this house and today's tomatoes price right and you multiply the two and uh, you do the same thing with a different house and uh, a different rate and keep on uh, multiplying the two and averaging it right if you take the mean out the product the expected value of the product will be zero right that's what it means by uncorrelated right does make sense okay. so consequently what happens to the variance this will be sigma x square so sigma x square is uncorrelated Okay. Is that fine? Okay. Yes. All right. So, um, if not, then they are correlated, and consequently, you cannot make that assumption that you can simply add the variances. Okay. So, in circuits, um, let's say you take two resistors. Let's say R one, R two, right? each of them has some noise associated with them right let's call it v and 1 squared that's the variance right associated with this some voltage noise variance we will come to all that what is the actual value later on but each of those has some noise and it has some variance okay now when you these two resistors are independent right and their variances will turn out to be also independent and then when you simply add this can you simply add this like this just connect the flip now so let's say we buffer it and then somehow in the circuit add it right the variance at the output will be okay so fine now let's take an example of from circuits where there is correlation okay so let's say there is a transistor and uh, it has some noise associated with it whatever that noise is i sorry. so this is just a transistor which has some brain current noise right now when you split this up into a voltage noise and a current noise right these two noise sources will be correlated or not why okay so the idea here is that these two noise sources are arising out of the same current noise id square right therefore these two noise sources will be correlated okay uh, so i'll try to you know add one question in the assignment where you try to find out how they are correlated but you get the idea right so when noise sources are arising independently of each other like two devices 
right? They are disconnected from each other and they generate noise of their own and they are not related to each other. Right? Whereas if somehow um, you model a noise source which is uh, some combination of um, or rather which is split up from one source itself then um, they like I will give you one other example. Let us say you have some noise source n1 and you have noise source n2 right. Now you take some linear combination of these two let us say you multiply this by alpha 1 alpha 2 and then add it together and you get a new noise source n a ok. Now you take the same with some different factors beta 1 and beta 2 right add it up and you get a new noise source n b right. These two noise sources are correlated right. So, because they arise from similar sources does that make sense. So, the next thing is um, is uh, this term called autocorrelation ok. Now, let me just uh, tell you what it is. So, let uh, some voltage or current waveform x of t hmm, so autocorrelation. So, let x of b t be either a voltage current or something right. Now, the autocorrelation of x of t is defined as follows. Anybody may get is defined as the average of x of t e plus o times ok that is the autocorrelation. So, it is kind of like convolution, but uh, there is a difference ok. I will tell you let us say you have like a, a two waveform x of t right. So, when you convolve x of t and um, x of t right let us say you convolve the two what you will do is you flip this right thing okay, and uh, then start moving it right and then you kind of multiply the two and add right that is the co convolution. In case of autocorrelation you do not flip it you just simply slide. So, this is here you just multiply the 2 and keep adding right. I mean you have done this in the signal system, but one thing to note is how do you get autocorrelation when you have 2 waveforms. So, let us say have a noisy waveform. That should be the easiest, right? How do you get Rx of t now? So basically, what you do is take the same waveform. Right? So you kind of get different waveform t. Um, you kind of shift this. By some tau, it's shifted in time with some tau, and you start varying tau and plot Rx of tau. Okay, that's basically how you get the autocorrelation function. Is that fine? This also goes in. Any questions? So, tau can take any value, right? It can be minus infinity. So, no constraint on that. 
Um, anything else? So multiply the two and take that. Are there any questions so far? So, if two resistors are fabricated from uh, on a same substrate, then the noise between them is correlated. Well, then you can split up that into the noise as originating from the resistance itself and one that is coupled from the substrate to each of those. Right. So, then they all three will be independent. That could be done, right? Yeah, the temperature different. The two resistors can be at the same temperature, but the noise that they generate can still be different. So, all right. So, uh, until here. Are you guys comfortable with this? Okay. So, um, the next thing is how do we look at noise in frequency? So, what are the ways in which we look at a signal in frequency? Like Fourier series, Fourier transforms. Laplace transforms, three transforms, there are so many ways, correct? Yes, so DFT, FFT, right? So, but there is a catch here. So, when you look at noise, right, is it periodic? Yes, no, no, it is not periodic, right? Noise cannot, it is kind of random values that is. So, can Fourier series be used? Yes, no, no, because Fourier series by definition is meant for periodic use, right? Now, is it is it finite? In type. So, can you use Laplace transforms? Right. So, noise is not limited in time, right? You can continuously keep measuring. If you have something like the following, which is finite, right, in time. Right, Laplace transform is minus infinity to infinity x of t equal minus correct. No? Yes, but I am just saying by definition the Laplace transform is taken as follows, right? Is that correct or not? Yeah, no, I don't know that particular at this point. Yeah, but if you just look at the definition of this Laplace transform, right, that we are usually used to, right. This integration of x of t power minus j omega t for all time cannot converge, right? Because x of t exists for every time. In usual case, you have some finite time like this, right? From some zero to some t p or something, then you can say it's zero at elsewhere, and you can evaluate this integral, right? But for noise, it's not it's not possible, correct? It's possible. So, uh, anyway, so there is this dilemma, right? So, we do not know, I mean, we can talk after the class over this, 
I am also interested in it. So, but this definition of Laplace transform as integral of x of t per minus j omega t is not valid because x of t is there everywhere, right? It is not 0 and you cannot put finite limits to that integral, correct? And uh, I try, I was myself confused about this and I spent some time trying to understand and I found this particular um, argument uh, to be uh, at least understandable, ok. Um, thing is that one way to look at um, uh, the noise behavior in frequency domain is to use uh, this uh, concept of um, or this theorem called a uh, Wiener Kinchin theorem, ok. I may be saying this completely wrong. Um, that does not matter. So, there is this theorem which says the following it says that the power spectral density, which is one way to look at noise in frequency domain, is the Fourier transform of autocorrelation. Ok. So, this is um, a way of looking at noise in frequency using power spectral density, all right. And uh, a representation of that is by this Sx of omega from minus infinity to infinity Rx of tau equal to j omega tau, right. And the inverse is also true, which is tau. So, does not matter. F code. You have a 2 pi factor coming in, that is the only thing, ok. So, this is one nice way of looking at noise and frequency domain, like taking the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation, alright. So, that brings me to what, huh? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Right. So, if uh, tau is 0, ok, what is the autocorrelation okay, from what we saw before? Huh? It is the variance, correct. So, when you say, uh, when we looked at this, let us say you did not delay it at all. Right, simply multiplied the values with each other, squared it and took the average, then that will turn out to be the variance, right. So, Rx of 0 is the variance of this one, ok. Now, if you look at it that way, what will this be? Fx of integral of 0. Okay, is that fine? Yes, no. All right. So, um, I think uh, right now uh, I there is one more. Okay, I will leave this as a question, we will come back to this uh, next time. Okay. So, now let us say the following, right. So, if every two samples of noise that you measure are not correlated between them, right, you get the idea. Let us say you have a waveform. 
which you have measured in noise, right? It's all random. Any sample you take has no correlation to the next sample. Okay. Now, what will the autocorrelation look if you simply move the waveform slightly away from each other? Zero. Right. So, is that clear? No. So, let us say you have this waveform, right. So, none of these samples um, are correlated to each other, right. This sample has no relation to this sample, right. Now, if you multiply the two exactly with each other and then you add it, right, then you get some value which is the variance, right. Now, if you slightly move it, if they are totally uncorrelated, take the example of uh, tomatoes and the area of the earth. They are totally uncorrelated. So, if two samples are totally uncorrelated, right, when you slightly shift the two waveforms, multiply the two to each other and average it, it turns out to be 0. So, how does the autocorrelation function then look? If you plot how and Rx of how, how does this look? It will be 0 everywhere, right. Which is sigma squared, and everywhere else it is zero. Is that okay? Fine. Okay. Now, if you take the Fourier transform of the pulse, what do you get? How will it look in frequency? It will be flat, right? So, yes. It will be an impulse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> yes, that's the right. Uh, you're right. So, how should I put it? Delta. Okay. Okay. So, okay, right, that's the right. So that's the mathematically correct way. Yeah. Okay. So, if you take the Fourier transform of this, how will it look? It will look flat. So, if the samples in time are uncorrelated. Then in frequency, the noise spectrum looks flat. Okay, is that fine? Okay, I think uh, uh, is that understood now? Now let's say the following: I take this noise and then somehow connect the different samples. A low pass filtering does it, right? What will happen? to the spectral density. So, if those two, ok, I think I am confusing you. So, I think this argument is clear here, right, why is it flat and frequency. So, what it means is that if there is total no correlation between the samples, okay, Right. And if you take the Fourier function like this, then you look at when you look look at the frequency, this is here. Right. And when you integrate this. Uh, SN of F, variance, can you integrate it from my, can SN of F be non-zero at all frequencies? No, right, then this integration will become infinity, right, so therefore you have to have some finite bandwidth right some somewhere it should die out right and uh, that's the argument here at least that means that this delta function is not really a ideal delta function it has some width associated with it when you integrate that then you get the value okay um, is that fine okay so that is good so 
basically a conclusion associated with this is the following important uncorrelated in time samples of noise in time means that R x R x of tau is zero for all time not equal to zero. Okay, right? That means my power spectral density is okay. On the contrary, if there is any correlation. In time, time, then Rx of tau has finite width. I mean, I'll call this. Then. Flat or white, right? Flat white is sometimes called pink, right? It has some uh, color. Okay. Color essentially means that it's not <laughs> okay. it's not white. This is some other name. This is the main takeaway from today's class that. If you have noise where samples are uncorrelated, then the power spectral density is flat. But if you have samples which have some correlation in time, then the power the Rx of tau has some finite width. Consequently, if you take the Fourier transform of it, it will not be. Okay. And uh, the next question in the last one minute is to ask. Uh, is it still Gaussian? Do you get it? How is it connected to Gaussian? When you filter a waveform which is noisy, right? Then it becomes colored in frequency. Then you put correlation between samples. But is this waveform still Gaussian? Why? That will, huh? we'll come to that question. I think you're partially right or almost right. Okay. I mean, I asked the question hoping that you'll give me the answer next week. But again, you know, all of you please find out uh, that if you have. Uh, any correlation of samples, then we said the frequency domain is not flat and it has some color, but if that waveform still Gaussian, right? So there's always this confusion. Whenever they say Gaussian and white, they seem to intermix these two, right? Is that true or not? I mean, particularly people in the telecommunication area always model noise with AWGN, additive white Gaussian noise. In electrical engineering, that's not always the case. At least for the circuits that we are interested in. Okay, I'll leave it with that. So next time we'll uh, touch upon that topic. Uh, so quick recap to what we did today, right? A lot of magic stuff. We started out by saying uh, what are the different noise types, right? And why we care about it because it determines how low of a signal we can measure. Right? What are the different names that is given to noise? And uh, then we said uh, very very briefly, you know, spend time. What is meant by probability distribution function, right? And its definition and how you get the mean as from it, and uh, variance, and how do you get variance from a measured noisy waveform, right? And then the definition of Gaussian PDF. And correlated uh, variables, uh, random variables, 
and uh, then if they are uncorrelated then we said the variances simply add ok and then uh, took example very straightforward examples that if a noise source is uh, a combination of is arising out if two noise sources are arising out from a same noise source then they will be correlated okay. and then uh, looked at autocorrelation and how we look at autocorrelation in frequency domain um, which is just the Fourier transform of the uh, power spectral density will be the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation ok. So, the next question for you guys I said what happens if you filter a Gaussian ok white noise. All right. Thank you.